here, Saskatchewan, 14 kilometers northwest of Saskatoon. On October 13, 1994, the body of 38-year-old Janet Sylvester was discovered in a wooded area just outside of Saskatoon. Evidence at the scene indicated that she was a victim of a homicide. Janet's case remains unsolved. Janet Sylvester was from the Dene Nation and grew up in northern Saskatchewan. As an adult, she spread her wings and moved to cities like Edmonton, Toronto, and then Saskatoon, but she was known to return home to Laloche to visit her family. Before she was murdered, Janet was last seen getting into a vehicle in Saskatoon on October 12, 1994, and was wearing a purple and gray jacket, a white sweater, jeans, and white shoes. The word Libra was tattooed on her right shoulder and her right arm was misshapen due to a previous injury. At any time during this broadcast or afterward, if you have any information that might help solve the murder of Janet Sylvester, visit our website. Someone out there has answers. Our goal is to find them. Did Janet know her killer? Why hasn't her killer been found? What happened to Janet Sylvester? Janet came from a large family and, at a young age, went to live with her grandparents and her older sister, Tony Lemeg. Growing up with Janet, we were both raised by my grandparents, Pierre and Elizabeth Sylvester. She came to live with us from about age two years old. Because at that time, our biological parents were going to Fort McMurray. My dad worked there all summer and they couldn't take Janet with them. So Janet originally came to stay with us for the summer while our parents were over there. Growing up, Janet and her sister were very close and spent endless hours of fun together. One of the things we loved playing was we had wooden floors for a long time. And this one time in our home, we, there was linoleum laid down all over the house. And Janet and I used to just slither across the floor. But a death in the family would be the end of Janet's childhood as she knew it. My grandpa died when I was 12 years old. And that's when life became painful. And Janet left for the city then. She left us after Grandpa died. Janet was eight years old when she moved to live with her parents and Prince Albert, and then as an adult went off on her own. She moved away. I don't really know what her lifestyle was like. And when we talk, she would ask me questions about grandma and myself. And part of her life, she did not share with me. But I know she moved around a lot. As an adult, Janet had two children who were raised by other family members, but she would still visit them. Her daughter, Crystal Sylvester, remembers her mom's special spark. They called her Smiley in the city because every time you approached her, she was always smiling. One of the memories I had of her was if we were walking anywhere in this town, everybody who passed said hi to her and she said hi back. Lauren Sylvester, Janet's older son, loved his mom's personality. She was really outgoing, fun. She was a lot of people, she had a lot of friends. But Janet's smile may have hit a troubled life. In October 1994, news of her tragic death was reported. Corporal Kelly Bates is from the RCMP Historical Case Unit from F Division in Saskatchewan and offers these details of Janet's case. We know that Janet Sylvester was uh, socializing at a business downtown Saskatoon on the night of October 12, 1994. Upon leaving that business, she was seen getting into a vehicle um, with a person or persons unknown to the RCMP. And the following morning, October 13th, she was found deceased at a rural location approximately 14 kilometers northwest of Saskatoon. Janet's case remains unsolved uh, and it is ongoing. Janet's older sister, Tony, will never forget the day she found out about her sister's murder from the RCMP. She said, Tony, 
they found your sister's body. And I said, my sister, who? Because I have several sisters. And then she said, Janet. When she said Janet, it was just like my head just went big. And I, I grabbed on the back of the chair to steady myself. And then the next thing I knew, I, I just started screaming. Young Crystal was living with her uncle and his wife, who had the heartbreaking task of sharing the news. She looked at me and she said that tonight, your mother passed away, she said. She told me that uh, they found her body on a field in Saskatoon yesterday. So I didn't hear about it till the day after. And I remember sitting there and the room got big. My head started spinning like in circles and I couldn't hear anything else that was being said to me because all I could here in my head was me screaming, why? Lauren Sylvester, Janet's son, recalls hearing about his mother's murder and the inevitability he felt about the news. I was going to residential school and then my auntie came there. But when I was growing up, it was always a time where I knew it was gonna happen. She had lived a pretty rough life. So. I remember when her body came back. I knew it was her face in the coffin, but in my mind, I kept saying, it's not her, it's not her. This is all just a bad dream. And yet, when I look at the coffin, it be her face. On October 13th, 1994, Janet Sylvester's lifeless body was discovered in a wooded area north of Saskatoon. Her family is left in mourning with more questions than answers, and an unknown murderer still has not been brought to justice. If you have any information, visit our website. In the fall of 1994, the body of 38-year-old Janet Sylvester was discovered 14 kilometers outside of Saskatoon, the victim of homicide. Janet was a mother, an aunt, a sister, and her case remains unsolved. Her family recall an outgoing, friendly woman with problems they hope she'd eventually overcome. Long before the struggles of Janet's life, she was a happy child full of imagination. My grandma bought me a three-speed bike. And so Janet used to line up kids and they would pay five cents to ride our bike to the hall. And she was the, she was the one that ran that business. It was my bike, so she did all the work. And uh, at the end of the day, then we would split up the money. She would find like different schemes, you know, trying to make a penny here, five cents there. And she used to like doing that. After Janet left their grandparents' home, it wasn't until she was older that Tony and her reconnected. I think we visited her like two or three times while she was living in Edmonton. And the rest of the places that she lived, I didn't get to see her, but she would phone me once or twice a month. She would keep me updated where she is. Janet's children loved their mother, but spent most of their lives apart from her. Um, well, I lived with my mother maybe about three, four years when I was younger. I didn't really live with her that much. But when she, when, when she did come back, it was tough sometimes because uh, a lot of alcohol abuse and stuff. I was raised in a foster home by my uncle and his wife. She would come down to Laloche to visit 
usually around Christmas, um, close to my birthday in the summer. It was during the summer of 1994 that Janet made her final visit to see her family. When she was close to her, her death, she came back to La Loge and there was a spell of time that she stayed here. From there, when she went back to Saskatoon, she told me that she was going to go pick up her check and then she was coming right back. But Janet never returned and Tony had a frightful experience the night she was murdered. I woke up my friend. I said, I hear a woman screaming. We kept looking up and down the street. We didn't see any anything out of ordinary. And that scream kept on for about, I would say five minutes, and then it stopped. In the wake of Janet's murder and the years that have passed, her family is left with unanswered questions and frustration. I feel her case has been left cold. It's been 23 years and they aren't any closer to solving this case. I feel because she is an Indigenous woman and because she lived the high-risk lifestyle that she's less important. After what happened to her, I started getting angry a lot. We were in the dark all the time and started to get answers from them, how the case is going. So we never really knew, actually. It was a very hard time to go through. Everything happened out in the city. Up here, we were just left alone to deal with the aftermath of her death. Cases like this can be difficult and challenging. And we uh, obviously recognize that um, they're particularly challenging for the families because of the amount of time that passes and they have questions that they want answered. Um, we endeavor to do the best we can to answer those questions and ultimately hope to solve these cases and bring a measure of closure to the families and justice to the victims. When Janet was taken, so was her chance to make new memories and the joy of being with family. I named my, my first child, my daughter, after her. It's still hard now because there's always the, what it would have been like if she was here. I loved her and all I ever wanted to do or be was with her when I was a kid. For Janet's sister, Tony, years have passed waiting for a phone call. Often she would phone me at least once or twice a month. And there were times when if I didn't get a phone call, I would be worried until she makes the call again. And after she died, my the way my body reacted when the phone rings, my first thought is, it's my sister phoning. It's my sister phoning. And then in my mind, the next thing that would pop us up is, she's gone. A victim of homicide, Janet Sylvester's screams went unheard on the night of October 12, 1994. With her murder unsolved and years of pain endured, how does her family survive? And who has the answers to help them? If you have any information that could assist Janet's family in the search to find her killer, visit our website. Janet Sylvester disappeared from the streets of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and was found murdered on October 13, 1994, just outside of the city. Her case remains open and is part of the RCMP Historical Case Unit. Her family has not given up hope for justice and continue to keep Janet's memory alive. If you have any information that might help solve the case of Janet Sylvester, visit our website. The community of Laloche is located nearly 600 kilometers northeast of Saskatoon. It is a small village known for its rich Dene history and culture, 
resilience and beauty, and is no stranger to challenges and triumphs. What I love about La Lodge is there's lots of humor. There's also a lot of pain, but people use humor a lot to stay strong. Each crisis that community encounters, people pull together. To honor Janet and other missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, the town of Lalash walk together each year so they will never be forgotten. When I think of her and I think of her case, I picture her case paper sitting in a box in the basement of a detachment covered in dust. The way she died is tragic. Um, she was dumped on the side of a road. Her naked body was found and she was badly beaten. To whoever did it, she was just another Indian, just another woman who meant nothing. But to us, she was something. So this is me bringing recognition to who she was and that she was somebody. She was a very loving person caring when she was around. I think about her lots. I've done a lot of work on my healing journey. And a lot of my healing is in my drum song. I walk close to a creator and the little time that I spent with Janet were very precious. That much I can say. A lot of it is when we were children. But today I draw from that because they were very precious. It was precious time for us as sisters. With the ongoing investigation, the RCMP are hopeful that someone will step forward. The main thing with cases like uh, Janet's that the RCMP needs is information from the public. Often, uh, particularly in these cases of historical nature, people have information, um, whether they know it's important or not, they have information about uh, what happened and the RCMP encourages these people to come forward and provide us that information and speak to us directly, or if they wish to remain anonymous, to use programs like the Crime Stoppers program. It could even be information that they don't realize is important. It may seem uh, trivial or unimportant to them, but it could be critical to our case. Janet's family hopes one day their questions will be answered. That's a long time to hold something like that, if you know. It's a long time to keep a secret, if you know. If you have any type of information, it would help us in putting some closure to her case because um, she deserves justice. I keep praying whoever did it would confess to her death. We haven't put a closure to it yet. You know, and it's been it's been a cross I've been carrying for a long time. I don't want her to be forgotten. The murder of a loved one takes its toll on a family, leaving an open wound and a void impossible to fill. I wish I could spend time with her, tell her how much I love her and I miss her. I pray a lot for her, for her. all the time, so. Go to the graveyard lots. I go through grief feelings, and when I shared that screaming I heard in North Balford, I sometimes wonder if that was like a premonition, you know, because we were so close. I don't have an answer to that other than I must have experienced something supernatural because we were very close. But one thing I'm grateful for is 
always told her I love her. That was my mother. <laughs> that was my children's grandmother. That was my auntie's sister. She was an incredible person. And anybody who met her would have told you that, that she was loving and she didn't deserve to die the way she did. If you have any information about the murder of Janet Sylvester, visit our website.